Hey folks, today's episode is brought to you by Stitcher Premium, which includes the WTF Rarities, Outtakes, and Remembrances collection. Go listen to rare live WTF episodes, candid moments that never made it into the show, and tributes to the lives of past guests who have since left us. This is a collection of 20 pieces of WTF bonus material going back to the earliest days of the podcast that you can only hear on Stitcher Premium. Go to stitcherpremium.com slash WTF and use the promo code WTF for 20% off your subscription. Okay? All right. Let's do the show away from the garage. Lock the gates! All right, let's do this. How are you, what the fuckers? What the fuck, buddies? What the fucking ears? What the fuck, Nicks? This is WTF, my podcast. Welcome to it. I saw the old man, the the source. I went to the source, and uh, he's all right. I did about an hour over there. That was about all that was necessary. I'll get into that in a minute. Today on the show, I talked to Alice Cooper, and I. It's interesting about Alice Cooper. I, you know, I'll tell you about that in a minute too, because I didn't. Of course, I know who Alice Cooper is. I know who uh, some of his music. I know his reputation in certain ways. I know my assumptions about him, but it wasn't until I went back and listened to a bit of almost every record he did before I really got a full picture in terms of you know, who he is musically, which I found to be uh, pretty fucking good. And I, obviously I'm not the first person to, to say that, but for unique reasons, and I'll, I'll get into that in a minute. I am up here in Santa Fe, New Mexico. I am doing the thing that I do sometimes when I come up here. I go to this uh, reasonably priced spa situation that is gorgeous. It's up in the mountains. It's called 10,000 Waves. You get a little room, and then there's a Japanese spa with the pools and, and tubs and massages. And today, recording as I am on Wednesday, the day after Tuesday, I had to, for the first time, I got shiatsu, and I had to get the Trump knots shiatsued out of the fibers of my fucking muscles. Because that guy infuses himself into your very genetic composition. What I started to realize... And look, you know, if any of you are like, no, here he goes again, you know, then don't fucking listen. Really, seriously, man. Just realize that, uh, you know, not only is this guy, this leader, this president, you know, probably you know, pretty mentally unstable, uh, which is not a surprise. And some people like that about him. He's erratic, whatever. The thing is, he's persistent. And if you check your phone a lot, what happens is you're, you're just inundating yourself with images of him. So, you know, you go to your browser and you start looking at stories and you could put yourself through 20 or 30 pictures of that guy a day. And if you are disturbed by what's going on or angered or terrified, keep pounding your brain with those images, which is hard to get rid of the images on your news browser. But I think it has somewhat the same effect as posters being everywhere, like Mao Zedong, like, like just there, or Stalin or any of the other, you know, famous fascists, uh, you, you just like, if, if they constantly put their image everywhere, which they usually do in buildings or they force you to do it in your home or it's constantly, it's on your TV too. Just this image of that guy's mug in varying degrees of, of anger and insanity and sort of, you know, false, uh, strength poses, uh, strutting pomposity poses. All of that takes a toll and starts hammering away at your psychic machinery. These are psychic terrorism tools and tactics at work to pummel your sense of outrage, to pummel your sense of what is moral and right, and also to pummel uh, what America is supposed to be. Don't be pummeled by putting yourself through multiple images of that guy into your head because it does not after a while you'll just kind of shut the fuck down which is what happens in authoritarian countries you just sort of like oh there he is again oh my god he's everywhere i'm exhausted uh what, let me just do my job oh i hope this turns out okay and they don't bother me oh god why am I so sad and thinking about death all the time? Don't do it. And if you don't know why it's happening to you, it might be the constant input 
of those images. And of course, anytime he spins out and goes all shitty Hitler on us somewhere in the United States, surrounded by, you know, his cult like following who enjoy chanting childlike slogans, that in addition to, you know, the constant uh, psychic pummeling with photographs will take its toll. Stay awake, stay vigilant, push back. Support for today's show comes from Audible. If you like listening to podcasts, that means you already like Audible because Audible has an unmatched selection of audiobooks, original shows, news, comedy, and more from leading publishers, broadcasters, entertainers, and business information providers. And Audible is different from streaming or rental services because you own all your books on Audible. So you can access them anytime, anywhere from almost any device, including your iPhone, iPad, Android, Amazon, Fire, tablets, or Windows phone. Plus, thanks to the Great Listen Guarantee, If you don't like your title, you can swap it out for a new one. And now there's Audible Channels, which gives you a collection of exclusive originals, short stories, and comedy, so you always have something new to listen to, like the new audio series, The Butterfly Effect, with John Ronson. Get a free audio book with a 30-day trial at audible.com slash WTF, like like the new David Sedaris book, Theft by Finding. Go get that. That's audible.com slash WTF for a free audio book with your 30-day trial. Dig it. So I went and visited my dad, and this is the thing. My dad is sort of trying to downsize a bit. He's trying to unload some stuff. He uh, was sort of a, a kind of an amateur art collector. He never bought too many winners, but, you know, he moved most of it out. He used to have a lot of art in his house of one kind or, or another, Native American art, some indigenous art from Alaska. He had some uh, paintings from modern painters here in New Mexico and then a bunch of paintings by this other guy that he got sort of hooked into buying an entire collection by this guy, Zerby, some encaustic in- abstract bits and you know, canvases, all gone. But there's one canvas that the old man can unload. And I said, maybe I could help you out. Maybe I could help you out. Now, I don't know. (laughs) I don't know if there's any nitty gritty dirt band fans out there or how much of a fan you are. If you know any nitty gritty dirt band fans out there, I, 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 I don't think you could know where this is going. But my father in his living room has a giant 68-inch by 162-inch canvas, and it is the full painting of the album cover of the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band's Hold On album. Okay, it was done by a dude named Stephen Rosser. Uh, You've got the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band there, and you've got sort of a ghost-bucking Bronco rider there with some UFOs on it in the middle of the desert. This is a giant piece of art meant for the hardcore nitty gritty dirt band fan. Now, if you have any of those in your life, look, when I look at it, I don't know why he bought it, people. I don't know what, but what point in his mind he would make that decision where they like, they're like, here's the album. They, he says, they told me not to open the album, the vinyl record. And I'm like, who told you? Is that going to add to the value of this particular giant painting that was an album cover for a later version of the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band? I mean, the album came out, I don't know, in the 80s. Well, I don't know anything about the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band. I know it did a couple of good ones early on, but what do I know? But I don't know why my dad bought this painting, but he definitely stuck with it. So I thought maybe there's an outside chance that one of you out there might have this moment like, holy shit, that is my favorite Nitty Gritty Dirt Band album. How much is that canvas? He's willing to negotiate. All right? You let me know. You let me know if you're interested. It's a big painting. And if you had that moment like, Damn, hold on by the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band? Holy shit. I fucking want that. I want that painting. I would, I, I'll let it take up an entire wall of my house, which it will. And if you have a friend that's sort of like, oh, that's my, that's my buddy's favorite nitty gritty dirt band album. Hold on, right? I love that fucking cover. You can own the painting. I don't know why he bought it. He's had it for years. I never knew why. I don't even know if he likes the nitty gritty dirt band. I, I don't know the story behind it. Maybe I should have asked, but I'm just putting this out there. All right. 
Well, did I mention that we're sponsored today by Warby Parker, a new concept in eyewear, contemporary eyeglasses that are extremely affordable and fashion forward. Glasses start at $95, including prescription lenses. Lenses include anti-glare and anti-scratch coatings. Warby Parker makes buying glasses online easy and risk-free. The Home Try-On program allows you to order five pairs of glasses shipped directly to your door, where you can try them on in the comfort of your own home and get feedback from friends, family, colleagues, the mailman, your pets, whoever. Try the frames for five days before sending them back using a free prepaid return shipping label with no obligation to purchase. It's 100% free, and it's so easy, even I was able to do it. That's the ad copy taking a shot at me, but it's true. It was really easy to do. And for every pair you buy, a pair is distributed to someone in need. So head to warbyparker.com slash WTF to order your free home try-ons today. Warby Parker makes your experience completely risk-free, and there's free shipping all around. And make sure to download the Warby Parker app from the App Store to use the home try-on companion feature, which makes it easy for your friends and family to help you pick a winner. That's warbyparker.com slash WTF to begin your free home try-on experience today. So Alice Cooper. Now, Alice Cooper is, uh, you know, there are a lot of people who love his stuff, and there's a lot of stuff to love, but, the, you know, he's also known, he's a very uh, out uh, Christian. He found Christ later in life, or refound Christ later in life after years of uh, drugs and alcohol, mostly alcohol. No problem talking Jesus, no problem talking music, no problem talking booze and drugs, and no problem telling stories about his career in show business. And I found him to be a completely pleasant, solid, professional dude. And one of the reasons I had him on, I met Alice Cooper the first time at Conan O'Brien. I had this moment where I was watching him. This was just like last year. And he was putting on his show. He had a hat on, a cane. He was doing sort of a shtick. And I realized, like, holy shit, it's all shtick. This guy is a traditional, almost vaudevillian showman and always has been. He's real show business. Alice Cooper is real show business. And I'm like, I gotta, I, I'll got i talk to this cat anytime he wants to. But what I didn't realize is that he's also real songwriter, man. I mean, I didn't, and obviously some of you are going, like, how did you not know that? But But what I didn't realize, it's like the songs that, some, I mean, he did a lot of great anthems. 18 is great. School's Out for Summer is great. Um, no More Mr. Nice Guy is great. But what I, I've started to do, and this was really the first time I, I did this, uh, and I don't know why I never did it, was when I'm dealing with an artist who has a massive catalog, which he does, you know, what I can do is I can just go to Apple Music and listen to a, at least a bit of every album, and I did. And what kind of blew me away about Alice Cooper was the two songs that when I was a kid, which were these slow songs, beautiful songs, both of them kind of make me cry. Uh, Only Women Bleed and I Never Cry. But those two songs are these sweet. They're not sweet. They're heavy, but they're slow songs. I mean, I Never Cry could be a fucking Elton John song. And it was then, you know, when I see the arc of where Alice Cooper comes from, from the first kind of out there records through sort of anthemic, you know, you know, teen rebellion records to like these, like these beautiful, I don't even know if they're called ballads, but Only Women Bleed and I Never Cry are fucking, if he had just made those two songs. Those are it, which really substantiates him and validates him, among other things, as this amazing songwriter. So, like, I had a, a tremendous sort of uh, epiphany with Alice Cooper before I talked to him. I'm very grateful I did because I entered with the proper amount of respect and not just this idea that, like, this guy was crazy with the snakes and the and the guillotine and the electric chair and that shit and killing chickens. So I, I was able to kind of go in impressed and excited and 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 he was very receptive and it was a great conversation this is me and uh, alice cooper uh, back in the garage it's cool though you know i mean it's like go, going to an old fm radio station right i used to love to go to fm radio stations. oh where they had the records they still yeah. have the records up and they on the said, wall what do you want to play you go oh let me just Paul look. Butterfield. Yeah, you right. <laughs> Paul Butterfield. Out of all things, that pops in your head. Paul Butterfield. Well, he was, that was the best band I ever heard. Really? When you were a kid? Yeah. Or like when you were coming up? Well, the, you know, we learned Paul Butterfield stuff because every good rock band ever yeah. was a, started as a blues rock band. Sure. We, You know, from the Stones to the Beatles, everybody. And if you could sit down and play Born in Chicago 
by Paul Butterfield and oh, learned yeah. some of the heart parts and learned some of the guitar. Oh, but yeah. That was learning process, man. Yeah, and, and he, it, well, they were, I guess it's interesting about Butterfield because he was like the, they were really the legacy of the Chicago blues. They oh. weren't British guys no. that were taking the records and yeah. recycling it. Exactly. They were, the Yardbirds were the closest thing to Paul Butterfield. Right. They were the, you know, they were the British blues guys. But when you grew up in, where were we in Detroit? Detroit. Did you, but who was coming through there? I well, mean, it that, was, I was, but you were know, a that little big. kid. But the coolest thing that ever happened to my family was my uncle, yeah. my uncle, my uncle, uh, Vince. Yeah. Was a boxer. Yeah. He's like a, a flyweight boxer, tough little guy, played telecaster guitar. Yeah. And Good brought guitar. me, the first thing he ever brought me was Chuck Berry. Sure. And Chuck Berry was the first thing before Elvis. Right. I heard Chuck Berry and I went, that guy just told me a story in three minutes. It was cr- It's pretty crazy, <laughs> right? He was the best lyricist he doesn't get of the, all time. He does not get the credit for being the no. greatest lyricist of all time. Like, like you listen to You Can't Catch Me. Yeah. Or, or, uh, too Much Monkey Business. Too Much Monkey Business. How, I mean, how many times did Dylan listen to that song? Yeah. I wonder. Hey, exactly. <laughs> and not only that, but but yeah. if he couldn't think of a word, he'd make one up. Sure, why not? He says, you know, don't give me no botheration. <laughs> right, that's I great. I love that word. You got licensed? The coolerator. Yeah, yeah, that, <laughs> the that's coolerator. Right. Yeah, coolerator's good. <laughs> Well, that's yeah. So you were like, what? Like, what was Detroit like then? Was your dad in the in the in the motor business? My dad was an honest used car salesman in Detroit, which means he made no money at all. <laughs> uh, and, you what? know, done on Jefferson. Have a second job? Oh no, no. And so he made no money. My mom was a waitress. You know, uh, and she was a, your chewing gum waitress. You know, what do you have? Is that true? Yeah. Really? Oh, she was great. Yeah. yeah, she's still alive, ninety-two years old. Really? Yeah. And but my dad. Finally got to the point where realizing that he worked for nothing but criminals. <laughs> and they finally said, Mick, you can't make any money in this business. You should become a pastor. He became a pastor. A, a pastor? My dad was a pastor. What Pro- denomination? Pro- Protestant pastor. And my grandfather was an evangelist. And my wife's dad is a Baptist pastor. So you come from pastors. You I, come from uh, I was the prodigal the son. Yeah. I was a prodigal son. I grew up in the church, went as far away as I could, and then came back. That's a, a yeah, because I I know you talk about it a lot, and you're pretty you're public about uh, uh, being a Christian again, yeah. or coming back around to it, yeah. But you but you did have an honest uh, uh, rebellion from it. Oh my gosh, and, and yeah. it was very public. I yeah, think. and so did Marilyn Manson. Marilyn Manson. You yeah, know, you guys getting along? And, oh yeah, we get along. I mean, not theologically, but <laughs> <laughs> we 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 you know we are good friends. Yeah, you know, and uh, and the thing about it is, is on the last uh, on the very last night of the tour that we worked together yeah and i got along with Marilyn really well i hear yeah. he's a nice guy i mean I, nice I, guy. I but like I, I i imagine there must have been some contention initially you spawned a lot of people well i i sparred with him in the press a lot you did you was know? that fake or was it no it was for real because he was talking about oh i used to really respect dallas till i heard he was christian and then you know oh, and, so and i'm a i'm a priest in the satanic you know church and i'm going anyone can be a I'm priest going, in the yeah, satanic yeah, church right you know and <laughs> then when i meet him all we talked about was marriage yeah oh really and I met him in Transylvania. How's that? That's funny. A festival in Transylvania. I mean, it's like the castle is there. And clearly they had, they had a theme in mind. <laughs> a theme. And he <laughs> walks by the dressing room, he walks in, and he said, can I come in? I went, yeah. So we sat and talked, and all we talked about was marriage. I've been married 41 years Yeah, to that lady, lovely lady. That was you, a, that's a, good. It's a good job. Yeah. You know, it's funny because uh, in terms of, like, uh, I've been hearing a lot about uh, the song, you know, I'm 18, because people have been emailing me. I just had 18 years sober last Wednesday. So people nice. have been sort of like, oh, you got to listen to, you know. Oh, that's like, your song. <laughs> I'm 36 <laughs> years now, I think. Sober. Right? Yeah. Feel better? Oh, you kidding? I would have been <laughs> long gone dead. I mean, I, you know, you have to remember, my big brothers and big sisters, when I came to L.A. Yeah. from Phoenix, yeah. Jim Morrison, Jimi Hendrix, Janis Joplin, they were like, I drank with them, and I was the little guy, little fly on the wall. Well, at that hotel? At, at the Landmark, you know. And that's where you met Shep? That's where I met Shep. Well, like, well, take me there from, like, so your dad's a Protestant pastor, which is not hardcore, no. per se, no, right? No, in fact, he, he, he could tell you who played bass for the animals. Sure. He's you like, know? but it's not fire and brimstone, it's no. not, but your grandfather was. But and, but they were, and, I, and my granddad was pretty cool, too. Yeah. But they were all loved music. They, yeah. He's, he, his deal was this. He says, look, I love the music. He says, I love the show. Will he take you to he's, rock shows? Yeah, but he, he saw the stones oh, with me. Yeah. Oh, yeah? And he says, I have no problem with I have a problem with the lifestyle. Uh-huh. 
And I went, okay. Talking about your stuff. Well, he says the whole general. lifestyle. You have to remember, that was right when the hippie lifestyle was, you know, just free love, free When you everything. were starting out. I just was getting ready to go to L.A. But when you saw the Stones, when did you see the Stones oh, with them? They 17 must, years old. Though. So they must, they weren't hippies yet. No. It was still kind of clean. Just, and, it was British invasion. Right. Cool. Cool stuff. And you saw them on, like, uh, like when you were 17, so... That must have been pretty electrifying. Oh, Do you know, and it was the real Stones. Right. It was Wyman. Sure. And, you know, yeah. uh, Brian Ian Stewart Jones. on piano, maybe? No, yeah. no, just the five. Oh, just the five. No lighting. Uh-huh. <laughs> it was just and five they were guys playing, playing. playing blues mixed oh, with a few of the hits. All the original songs. All the original first two albums. So you see the Stones, so they're in your head. Yeah. How about the Detroit guys? Is, is Mitch Ryder around yet, or like who's around? Those guys were on the radio, Yeah, but I wasn't really connected up with them because I was so locked in. To Motown? The, uh, Motown was on the radio again, but I was living in Phoenix now. Already? So, yeah. I How'd was you get there Phoenix. that quick? I, at 10, I had to get out of there because of asthma. I had to get out of Detroit. You, I you had were the asthma one with asthma. So bad. And oh, so yeah. your family moved because they wanted you to be able to live and to breathe. breathe. It would be a yeah. good thing. <laughs> the kid. Kid's got to breathe, apparently. So I'm in Phoenix, and yeah. I'm painting the house, you know, on a summer, and the radio's always on, and all yeah. of a sudden I hear, doom, doom, she loves you, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, I stopped, and I went, what was that? Right? It can still make you stop, right? Uh, really? It was, I've never heard anything like that. And then about a half an hour later, I heard, please, please me, yeah. oh yeah. And I went, what is this? <laughs> you know, I'm honestly, it changed my life. I called my <laughs> Dennis Dunaway, who was yeah. our bass player, original bass player. Yeah. We ran track and cross country together right. in high school, yeah, in yeah. art class. Yeah. And I said, did, did you hear that? And he goes, yeah, what is that? <laughs> Next thing we saw a picture of him, and I said, that's it. That's what we're doing. We got to do that. We got to do that. It's it, that first album, like you, you know, like so I, good. Well, yeah, I just got <laughs> I got chills, kind of. Yeah. Because I, you know, I'm I'm a little younger than you, about, about a decade or so. But but I, we had that record, oh, and just like you put that on now, and you're sort of like, what the fuck? I tell bands all the time, young bands, yeah. that you know, they go, uh, we'd like you to produce us. I said, let me hear what you're doing, and you know, they got a great image. You guys are tough. I yeah. get it. And like this. And then they yell at me for about three minutes yeah. in a, with a hook and a right. drum beat. And I go, I want you to do three things. Yeah. So I want you to listen to the Beatles' first album, The Four Seasons, and The Beach Boys. <laughs> and they look at me like, why? And I said, because that's how songs are written. Now, write me the sa a song and be just as angry. Yeah. I get it. You're angry. Yeah. But now write a song with a verse, a B section, a chorus, and then yeah, and be that, angry. Yeah. Yeah, but that's well, because that's sort of what, like, the, the weird thing about going through your stuff today, which I did, just to, like, I literally went through just to, because I grew up in the 70s, and there's songs on in your catalog that were hits that are, like, beautiful. They're not hard rock songs. They're, you know, like, Only Women Bleed, oh. I Never Cry. Yeah. Uh, like, you know, and I remember, they're dug into my brain, and I'm like, oh, fuck, right, that's Alice Cooper. You know, <laughs> like, that that moment. We confused a lot of people on those. <laughs> well, well, I mean, but but those were, you loved those songs, I'd imagine. Yeah, they were great. And they were the easiest ones to write. Yeah. Those songs, for some reason, were the easy, harder to write a simple rock song than a simple ballad. Uh-huh. Um, but I was working with all the right people. Bob Ezrin was our George Martin. And is he the guy that, that, that Shep hooked you up with? The Canadian? Well, he Who was Canadian the Canadian guy, yeah. He came out and he was supposed to get rid of us. Oh, really? And he listened to us at Max's Kansas City. We played at Max's one night and he came. Jack Richardson said, get rid of these guys. We don't want them on our relevant. Which label was this? Um, it was Jack. We just wanted him to produce. We so, didn't care about a label at this point. Oh, so we you just, weren't even signed yet? No. Nothing. And the next thing you know, you know. Bob Ezrin comes back and he goes, "You're gonna, you're gonna fire me, but I love them." He says, "They're the future. They're, they're, they're what's going to happen. I can take this band." And he says, "Your punishment is you have to produce them." Oh, really? That was it. <laughs> well, seven platinum yeah. albums later, it yeah. was a good punishment. <laughs> yeah, you worked with them on and off for a long time. But let's go for it. So you're you're with your track and uh, field buddy. Yeah. Uh, what's his name? De Dennis Dunham. De Dennis. Yeah, from who's in the original band. And you listen to the Beatles, and now you know how do you start out in rock and roll? It's very, it's a very funny story. I mean, you probably couldn't write this. Yeah. So we're all we're jocks. Yeah. Four year Letterman. Really? Yeah. Like you, track you're, and so cross you're a country. senior at this time? Uh, track and cross country. No, freshman. Okay. So I I got four stripes here from track and cross country. Dennis has four stripes. Our drummer has four stripes. Yeah. So we're the we're walking through this this you know the school like we own it. Yeah. Right. Right. Now, 
I said, we, I said, we got these three guys. We want, we should do like at the Letterman's Club talent show. Right. We should do a mimic of the Beatles. Yeah. Put the Beatles hats on. Right. We'll do, I'll beat you. Yeah. 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 All right. Beat, sure. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and we did it and we hired girls to scream for us. And at that moment, I went, this is what I'm going to do for real. And you're just lip syncing at that We're point. We're right. No, we sang. Actually yeah. sang. We found Along the, with it. We found the two biggest juvenile delinquents in the school. Yeah. Glenn Buxton and John Tatum. Who were always in fights or always illegal is at every the point. opposite of jocks, right? And yeah. they were our guitar players because <laughs> they knew how to play. They ended up Glenn ended up being one of the great yeah. rock guitar players. Yeah, he was time. on all the all the band records, right? He, all he the created, Alice Cooper yeah, records. Yeah, he created schools out. You know, he created all that stuff. He was the only guy that could jam with Sid Barrett. <laughs> right, he yeah. got it. Right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, anyways, now we've got a band, and we're actually pretty good. At this point, are you like, uh, are you, uh, is your faith intact? Yeah. Yeah, but you're not like, uh, I, I nutty. go to church still, right, right. you know, and everything, and I'm still running track, and right. so, but we're, we are in this little band playing at parties. In Phoenix. Getting a little better. Yeah. Finally, we get this job at the VIP club. Right. What's that? That's, that's the big club. Yeah. In a thousand Phoenix, people. That, oh, yeah. You know, and we're called the Spiders now. Uh huh. And we were all black. Yeah. And there's a web behind us. So it's beginning. And we it's start starting. out with the Who. And we start out with the Yardbirds and Train Kept a Roll. You remember? Oh, you did Train Kept a Roll. What Who oh, song were you doing? Yeah, uh, the Yardbirds version. Uh, which, yeah. who, uh, which Who song you, were uh, you doing? We were doing Out in the Street, uh huh, uh, Substitute, uh huh. You know, all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we were really a good, co- good bar band. Combo, good yeah. combo. So we're drawing a thousand people a week. Got hot now, in Phoenix. Now we're not only jocks at the school. But you're, yeah. Now we're the biggest band in the school. So Local I become, rock stars. I become Ferris Bueller. Yeah, man. I run the school. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> man. Point, and everybody's doing my homework. Teachers, I've got conned to no end, mm-hmm. you know, and I just was breezed through high school. And you guys. loved it. You felt it. You lo- I loved you, it. You loved the attention. You loved, loved being. You- and we were good. That's the thing I liked about it was the fact that if we were just phony, it would be different. But we were actually really good. What was it about the Yardbirds that, that, that really floated your boat so much? You know, we loved the Beatles. Every, the Beatles influenced everybody. Sure. I don't care if you're cradle of filth. Yeah. You were in, you were influenced by the Beatles. Yeah. The Stones, same thing. Yeah. So when people say who influenced you, that's a given. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. we then went for what about this band that's got this guitar that sounds like it's out of control? Yeah. Well, Pete Townsend. Yep. And Jeff Beck. Right. Those were the guys. We heard those songs and went, oh. I still man. can't wrap my head around Jeff Beck. No. It's nobody like, can. It's like, I don't know. I, don't I think know. even Jimmy Page said one time, there's all of us. And then there's Jeff Beck. Yeah, and Jimi Hendrix said, like, I talked to Billy Gibbons, who's on your new record, yeah. who I love. Yeah, Billy's great. He's great. He's great. He said when he opened for Hendrix in Texas on that tour, when yeah. he was, I forget the name of Billy's first band. It wasn't. Uh, I was Moving Sidewalks. Moving Sidewalks. Yeah. That he went and hung out in, uh, with Jimmy, and Jimmy would have a, a stereo console brought up to the hotel, and, and he would just sit around trying to figure out what Jeff Beck was doing. Everybody. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> plays as pure as Jeff Beck. It's crazy, And Jimmy's man. the best guitar, rock guitar player. Hendrix. Clapton is the best, blues you know, guitar player. blues player. Yeah. Jimmy Page is right there. I'm a big Peter Green fan. Peter Green. Oh, my God. Great. We used to play with him in Detroit when he was with Fleetwood Mac. Did you really? Fleetwood Mac. Yeah. With Peter? Yeah. He must and have been. And Savoy Brown, who is oh, now sure, man. Fog Hat after yeah. that. Fog Hat. Yeah. But was, was Peter Green a heavy cat? Do you yeah, remember him? Yeah, he was him? cool. Very like, cool. He seemed like, like, like... He wasn't psychotic at that point. But, but was he sad? No. Uh, he was a rock guy. Because he felt like, I felt that, his, the way he sang, man, it was like, yeah. whoa, yeah. sad. Well, I he love was a him, blues though. guy. I'm, so with, I'm trying to get little bits and pieces of Peter Green wherever I can. Yeah, he he wasn't as close as some of the other guys. Yeah. Like, we met the Claptons and all those sure. guys, the Jimmy Pages, and they were kind of cool. Really in Detroit. Cool yeah, Green was a little, a little out there. Yeah yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it feels that way in general. It wasn't, like, warm. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, yeah. See, my, Jimmy my... was the best guy. Jimmy was the nicest, coolest guy. Hendrix ever. was. I always found that the bigger they were, the nicer they were. The oh, Beatles nice. were the nicest guys in the world. Well, the Stones, the nicest guys. But you didn't meet them till later. Yeah, not till later, but they really... I found something out about Sinatra and Presley and all those guys. The bigger you got, the less of a jerk you were. 
Well, yeah, because you, you, you really, like, your life didn't enable you to really hang around with anybody that much. Well, and not only that, but you don't have anything to prove. Right, right, yeah. You've done it. And you're, and you're kind of happy to talk to somebody, especially if someone's introduced yeah. you, like, this is this guy, he's a good guy, and you're like, okay, yeah, uh, you're cool. He's already yeah. got his status. That's he's right. He's there. It's the guys on the way up that are the jerks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then and then sometimes you see him fall down. Yeah. Right? And you kind of push him, help yeah. push him a little. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So, Maybe you put your foot out, trip a little. Yeah, oh, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. Maybe you learn a little lesson. <laughs> Write a song about that. So, uh, all right. So, how do you get from the Spiders to uh, Los Angeles? I mean, what? So now we're the best band in Phoenix, and so Maybe. we didn't think, well, we're going to go to L.A. and conquer L.A. because now, yeah. we're the best. We get to L.A. and realize that every band from every city, yeah. the best band from every city, is in L.A. trying to get in the whiskey yeah. or one of the five or six clubs going on there. Yeah. And you're up against the doors. Yeah. Love. Oh, yeah. All these great What's bands. It was Albert Lee, right? Uh, is that Arthur Al- Lee. Arthur Lee, yeah, Arthur yeah. Lee. Albert Lee's another guy. And uh, Buffalo Springfield. Oh. You know, you're up against... So they were all out there when you went out yeah. there. So and they got... were already big. They were yeah. already... So that's what, 68, 69? You're killing yourself to get in any club. What year? Uh, 67, 68. So you guys go out there, green. Starve. Just green. Just and, starve. But you made the move. We made the move. We changed the name of the band? Changed the, well, we didn't change the name of the, we were the Naz then. N-A-Z-Z. Then, like, uh, but Rundgren had the Naz. Uh, then we found that out. <laughs> and we said, we got to come up with a name now. And the first name that came up, Dennis came up with the Husky Baby Sandwich. Yeah, that's And little, I said, that's cool, that's yeah. great, but yeah. they'll be expecting that. Yeah. Let's do something that they're not going to expect. Yeah. What if you get this notorious band that we were, by this time we were notorious. In Phoenix. In, in L.A. too. For doing what? People just didn't get, we were already very theatrical at the time. Like what was the theatrics at that well, time? Well, anything that we could find. If I could find a mop, mm-hmm. that was part of the show. If I could find a bucket. I was so kind of riffing. carrot top. Of yeah, yeah, yeah. Was, <laughs> what have I got? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was, anything was guerrilla theater on stage and we did it. And the stuff sounded like, sort of like, psyched, like psychedelic noise, like Pink it, Floyd. Well, it like, was songs, but they were not at all what you would normally hear. You know, on I mean, purpose. We were doing pretties for you songs right. at that point, and even which is I like. I like that record. You, you know, because it's it, weird as hell. It is weird as hell. And, and I, did, did you find at that time you were being intentionally weird? Or yes, we <laughs> uh, were art majors, <laughs> yeah. and we and everybody sounded like this. I said, if we can just throw a little Yardbirds, yeah, and then do this, and Dennis would bring in these songs. Yeah, when we played them for Frank Zappa, Frank listened, and he says, I don't get it. Frank didn't get it. Yeah. That's a problem. And I went, is that good or bad? And he goes, no, it's good. <laughs> he says, I don't get it. And he says, "What? you have five songs yeah. that are two minutes long and has 37 changes in each song. And it never goes back to one of the changes. Right. And I went, yeah. yeah. And he goes, I don't get it. Yeah. And he said, where are you guys from? He said, San Francisco. And I said, we're from Phoenix. He goes, okay, now I don't get it at all. Right. You're supposed to do cowboy music there. <laughs> you know. So, so you he were, signed us because of that. Were you, you were an art school major? We were all art majors. From, and, in uh, college? And, you went no, to, and just in high school. Oh, you were just art yeah, guys and was, jocks and rock stars. But we were really way into Salvador Dali. We were way into really obscure yeah, electronic, yeah. but we were also way into West Side Story. Yeah, we were way into James Bond themes. Yeah, and we were the generation that was brought up on TV themes. Sure. So you'd find a little bit of I Spy. Yeah. In one of the sure. th- in the guitar, yeah, you'd yeah, find a little bit it. of Man from Uncle over yeah. here. And also, like I, I noticed that there is sort of like uh, uh, you know, what's the word? It's not. There is sort of a, a, a cabaret feeling to like a burlesque vaudeville. thing, vaudeville, very like, vaudeville. But but did you? But were you conscious of that? No, we didn't understand it. Why? That to me, why not make the lyrics come to life? Mm-hmm. We couldn't afford it, but why not make the lyrics come to life? If you're going to say later on, if you say "Welcome to my nightmare," you give them the nightmare. Yeah. Don't just say it. Produce the nightmare. Why not? Nobody else was doing it. It's like opera. Yeah. And if you're going to be the villain of rock, which I said, you've got all these Peter Pans and no Captain Hook. Yeah. I said, I will gladly be Captain Hook. I'll be Moriarty. Sure. You'll be the heel of Uh, the industry. Oh, I want to be the guy that when I walk in the room, people take a step backwards. Mm -hmm. And they go, it's Darth Vader. Right. Because they didn't have one. They didn't have one on purpose. Jim Morrison was the closest thing. But he he was was more of a a mysterious. Right poet yeah right you right. know this guy i wanted to walk into a room and terrify people yeah on purpose yeah 
Now, did you did you see Jim and all those guys? Did you? Oh yeah, I used to, we toured with uh, you know the first people that ever took us under their wing in L.A. were the Doors. And this is one. Tell, tell me, so how did you sixty seven? How did you end up? Like, what was the scene? You come out in sixty seven. Where do you live? We lived where we finally <laughs> we met this guy named Doak. Yeah, we had never met a gay person in our life. Sure. This guy lived right in the, the, the West Hollywood. He was an actor, and he and he, he somehow said, "You guys can all live at my house." Yeah. Okay. But didn't come on to anybody. Yeah. You know, and we all went okay. Yeah. So there were seven of us living in the living room of his house. Yeah. Well, at least we had a place to stay. Sure. And it, I don't know how we survived that, you know. But Why? I mean, fi- was well, on? it wasn't that. It was just the fact that I don't even know how we got money enough to eat. We had enough money, just enough. No get, one was working? We were working, but just enough to barely get gas right. for the car and, you know, eat whatever. We, the idea was at that point, find a girlfriend who has a job. Yeah, that's always the rock idea. That was it. Yeah, we had to do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't think he invented that and one. And then when Mike, when Mike Bruce would take his girlfriend into the bedroom, we yeah. would go through her purse, but we were smart enough to only steal $20. Sure, right. Yeah. $20 so would the band for a from week. From stealing money from your parents. That's exactly right. Where's right. dad's wallet? And, and we could yeah. rationalize it. It's for the good of the band. And she'll know that if we get caught. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so if we all had girlfriends, we could live. Oh, yeah, oh, good. You had a real <laughs> business plan in place. Yeah. So how did you tell me about that hotel where you met Shep, though, and where, you know, where Jimmy and Janice and everybody took? I mean, it's you know. so funny because Shep and I always have different stories on how it all worked because, you know, we were high all the time. Well, that's so. what Shep said. Like, he's basically a drug dealer. <laughs> yeah. Shep was a drug dealer. Yeah. So we're living at this point now. We're yeah. playing in a place called the Cheetah Club. Mm-hmm. And we become sort of the house band there. The Naz does. Mm-hmm. Right. And we're playing every night and we finally get a house. But we. Oh, no. I'm sorry. Yeah. Free house. Yeah. We're living in the Chambers Brothers basement Wait, wh- in what? Watts. Wait, what? Chambers Brothers had a house in Watts yeah. on Crenshaw. Yeah. We lived in the basement. How'd you hook up with the Chambers Brothers? They were friends Brothers. of ours, and they just said, hey, look, you know, you guys don't live anywhere. You can have our basement. The Chambers Brothers just happened to be friends of yours. Time. Yeah. yeah. And happened to be friends of Shep. Mm-hmm. And we hadn't met Shep yet. Mm-hmm. So... Friends we, meaning he, they got drugs from Shep. Right. Right. And... So finally, at some point, Jimi Hendrix comes over because Jimmy knows the Chambers Brothers. Sure. Now, crazy as it sounds, in yeah. Phoenix, when Jimmy played Phoenix, we met Jimmy. Right. And we came up out of the basement like rats, you know, and he goes, hey, I remember you guys from Phoenix. <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, yeah. All right. <laughs> so anyways, he goes and he meets Shep, buys grass from Shep. Yeah. And he goes, you know, Shep, you're going to get busted. You're a young Jewish guy yeah. in L.A. You got a lot of money. They're going to figure this out. Yeah, that you don't you don't have any means of support. Right, you should be a manager. You're Jewish. You yeah. should be a manager. <laughs> that's what she. <laughs> I know that sounds very stereotypical, no, no, I, but I it, it. Yeah. that's exactly what it was. Yeah, and he said, "I know this band that needs a manager." Yeah, he's talking about us. So we go over to Shep's, we knock on the door, and I knock on the door, and it's a fog bank. It looks like. I can't see two feet in front of me for the smoke. <laughs> yeah. And when I clear the smoke, yeah. it's Jim Morrison sitting on the couch, Janis Joplin, Jimmy. At that hey, hotel. Jimmy. The yeah. Landmark? is that Landmark it? Hotel. Yeah. And, you know, we could make a joint last for a week. Sure. Because yeah. that's all we had. Well, it wasn't even that good a pot Chef then. Chef goes like yeah. this. It takes a handful. and just, we say, here. And I went, that's our manager. Yeah. <laughs> I love this guy. <laughs> so he, that was it. Never a hand, never a, any piece of paper. You, you know, it's interesting. Jumping at 48 years. Yeah, he's a great guy. I, you know, I really like talking to him. But what's interesting about the business in general that I, I'm always fascinated with in both movies and music is that people, I think, forget how small a community it was. Oh, yeah. Then. Everybody knew everybody. Right. Because, you know, you, they, everyone was sort of around the same place. That's Jimmy right. knew the Chambers Brothers. Yeah. People would come and try to make it work. Or it did or it didn't. But there, was, there wasn't thousands yes. of people. No. And it was a very, we really got into this creative the people that were really good people. The yeah. doors were great people. And what did you Jimmy learn from them? Great. Like, I mean, what did you like? What did you glean from these cats? I mean, I later on the biggest lesson of my life. Jimmy died at twenty-seven. Yeah. Jim Morrison died at twenty-seven, and I looked at it and I said, "What is what is in common here?" And that what it was was trying to live that image off stage. Yeah, you wanted to make it past twenty-seven, right? Yeah. And I saw, you know, I said, "I'm going to have an image even more." 
you know, heavy than theirs. Yeah. And for a long time, I couldn't figure out that I couldn't do both. Uh, you know, I'm going to go out tonight. Well, I got to get a snake. I got to put my makeup on. I don't want to disappoint anybody. <laughs> got to a point where I said, that's what <laughs> killed these guys. So I've got, it took me till I got sober to realize that I had to play Alice Cooper and be myself the rest of the time. It was, it was it, but you, it took you till the eighties? Pretty much. I mean, I never was. I never quite knew where Alice began and that one ended. Well, how did you now? Because we, I drank right through it. You know, I mean, I just. And, I, but I, also, you were not. I mean, you know, I, Janice was strung out, and yeah. Jimmy. I don't know what happened there, but he was on everything, yeah, right? Yeah. And it didn't seem like those were Jim your... Jim Morrison took pills like you would eat Skittles. Yeah, but it didn't seem like that was your bag. You were kind of old school. It was beer. <laughs> I was beer. beer beer guy. Yeah, I was. At the, in fact, most heavy bands were beer guys. Right, because we you could guys. keep drinking it all day. Yeah, yeah. And, and we were terrified of the police. Oh yeah, because yeah. we were the first perfect target. Look at our hair. Our hair's down to our waist. Right. I mean, we were the targets in L.A. So, the, but the idea that you couldn't differentiate or that the line between Alice and you was 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 blurry, like because I, you know, Rollins told me I had Iggy Pop in here. Yeah. And did you did you see them when they came out? I in grew 69? up with Iggy. Yeah. You did. We played with Iggy every weekend. But know? like you talk to him, and he ain't he's not Iggy Pop. He's Jim Osterberg. Yeah. And you know he's sharp, and there's definitely a, a line. Yeah. Between the two. Oh yeah, that, absolutely. I I knew Iggy first time I saw Iggy. We played at a pop festival, two hundred thousand people in Michigan. Yeah. And somebody says, "Well, you're going on after the Stooges." And I went, "Who are the Stooges? I'd never heard of Iggy mm -hmm. and the Stooges. I never heard of the MC5." Yeah. Right. You know, I knew Mitch Ryder, yeah. but I didn't know any of these bands. The next generation. So I saw Iggy play, and I went, what? Yeah. I said, I got to go on after this guy? I said, okay. And so I, I brought the Alice character up, <laughs> and everybody in Detroit saw it, and they loved it. Yeah. Because it was not just hard rock, but it was this, too. Yeah, yeah. And now here was a guy to challenge Iggy. Right. In a different way. That Detroit sound, though, is certainly in those guys and in, in MC5. Absolutely. You know, that drive. I still, right, so I still say it's in our DNA. I mean, born in Detroit, cars, yeah. motors, black leather, long hair. Something. Just, it's, it, I find it, it's in what I write all the time. Even the Nuge back in the day. The Nuge, Bob Seger. Bob Seger's great. Uh, Brownsville Station. Yeah. All these bands came out of Detroit. Yeah. And if you were a soft rock band, you were going to get killed. Yeah, and some of it had to do, I think, with the Motown infusing into it. There was a lot of soul. Mitch was a soul And those singer. guys would come to the show. I yeah. mean, we'd be on stage at the East Town or the Grandy yeah. with the Stooges and the MC5 and the Who. Yeah. You know. Hanging that out. Would, that would be. And we'd be up there. We'd look down. There's Smokey. Oh, really? You know, and there's this guy. And there's, all the Motown guys came down because they dug the rock and roll. Sure. We would go see them at the Rooster Tail. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So the Detroit scene during the riots. Yeah. If you were a long-haired rock guy, you had a free pass. Right. Right. If you were in a rock band, you could go into any black club downtown during the riots and you were fine. Well, that was the 60s. Yeah. And they, uh, it was assumed that everyone was on the same team, the long hairs and we the were, civil Yeah, we were not team. a threat. Right. <laughs> well, so how did, like, what happens here? So, like, I want to clear something up that, so you, like, Frank Zappa had a, you know, he got his own deal through, what was it, Warner? Who was it? Who gave him It was that? Warner Brothers. And his, and his imprint was called what? His label? He was Bizarre and yeah. Straight Records. So Straight Records was your first deal. Yeah. Right? And he signed you for three records. Right. Frank would come in at the end of the day. And he said, this is how he put it. He said, people are not going to believe that you can do these songs live. Yeah. He says, anybody can layer, you know, bass, drums, da, da, and, and make it sound. Right. He says, the fact that you can do No Longer Umpire and Tootie Muller and 10 Minutes Before the Worm, <laughs> which were insanities. He says, the fact that you can do these songs live is what I want to get. 10 Minutes Before the Worm. It was just the weirdest <laughs> stuff ever. And we could play it live. You could? Yeah. You had it And tight. we played it great tight in right. life. Yeah. He said, anybody can do jam stuff. Yeah. He said, but you guys play these specific little two-minute songs and don't make mistakes on them. And he said, the mothers couldn't play this song. Yeah. And he that's said, it. so that's what I want to get on tape is the fact you guys playing live. The good part was that we could do it. And you did it. Yeah. We and made that, the record in three days. And that's it. But that was, Frank wanted that. Frank, that's how he put it. Yeah, I think we were a tax write-off. That's what I was wondering. Yeah. Yeah, like it seemed like the whole thing. He liked us. He thought we were, would be fun to be with the GTOs and Wild Man Fisher and, you know, on his group, a little group of freaks. Right. We had a whole different thing. We were serious about what we were doing. Were you a fan of Frank's music? Oh, yeah. Oh, you know, uh, yeah. We're Only Enough for the Money, one of the funniest albums of yeah. all time. Absolutely yeah. free, one of the funniest albums 
of the you know of right. all time. Um, yeah, yeah, we worshipped Frank. Frank yeah. was great, but we didn't let him. He, he didn't really influence us, though. Right. But Everybody like, thought that we were influenced by Frank, and I said, no, he was really not any influence on us. Well, that's what, like, Chef sort of, like, thought that, you know, it was sort of a setup somehow. Uh, it, it felt to me that, you know, that it was the tax write-off idea, but you don't really feel that way. I, I feel that it was a little bit of each. I right. think that, But I think the tax write-off thing came from Herbie Cohen. Oh, I yeah. I think the Cohen brothers in there were, were we were really nothing to them. We right. couldn't make money. There, there was no potential commercial potential coming out of us so how did alice cooper the name come up we kind of dropped that there's no ouija board there's no mystical element no, it was just it's, let's do something let's come up with a name that is like a little old lady that lives down the street that makes cookies for the kids yeah but she may have bodies buried in the basement sure so what name is that the very first name that came out was alice cooper i was trying to betty crocker was kind of was in my yeah, head right. but alice <laughs> cooper sounded like that right and it stuck. Yeah. We kept coming up with names, and everybody kept coming back to Alice Cooper. So at the time, then, so like you guys, like it wasn't unusual. People were, you know, it's the sixties, so they're not. There, people are, are are outfitting themselves in in a big fashion. Yeah. So like the spectacle of rock was starting to evolve yeah. uh, in a way that in, in involved characters. It was happening, yeah. right? Yeah. And you chose to be the bad guy. Chose to be the the band that if your parents hated us. We that were just was, fine. So that was the point. Now, was that your idea? Was Shep involved in that? It just naturally... Shep, I think, Shep caught on to it. Yeah. He would see why people liked Elvis, because parents hated Elvis. Why do people like the Rolling Stones? Because the parents hated the Rolling Stones. So, My yeah. parents weren't crazy about the Rolling Stones when they first saw them. Right. Suddenly, the Beatles were fine. Right, sure. Uh, so taking that little nugget, all of a sudden, Alice Cooper was going to be this super mega villain that was going to really upset everything and Shep's learning too as he goes along with you guys because he's just uh you know he's a former drug dealer turned manager yeah and, and and not only but it wasn't a day of internet right it, right everything was built up on if we did a show with a snake yeah. a foot two foot snake the next day it was a 14 foot snake Sure, sure. In and the that papers, worked. and he he said he released Seated the chicken it. right didn't Shep, Shep, Shep plant the chicken. To this day, he will never tell me that he planted the chicken. Oh, I thought he said he did. But the chicken story was so brilliant because, yeah. you know, after I think about it, we're on stage. The very last thing we do is we it's open in Canada? up. You in Canada? In Canada at the, at the Toronto <laughs> Peace Festival. Yeah. 60,000 people. Yeah. We're on between The Doors and John Lennon. Oh, yeah. So we're on the very last of Peace thing. We get up there and we play our... Are you, for doing, you. are you doing uh, are you dressed up are you totally be, we look like some out of barbarella but not eye makeup yet not oh that, yeah but Full, the, the, not, the not that one but, but yeah. oh but just stuff lots of makeup yeah, yeah. lots of we really did look you like barbarella. A dress yeah i wouldn't wear a dress but all vinyl with the you know <laughs> lightning bolts all over it and everything yeah, yeah. and everybody else was kind of glam kind of glam <laughs> right yeah yeah everyone's poking out oh there was no such thing as glam at this point You're not yet we were glam yeah right yeah and at the very last thing, we open up pillows yeah, and CO2 cartridges, and it fills the place like a snowstorm. Yeah. And then I look down, and there's a chicken. <laughs> now, I didn't bring the chicken. And I'm going, I'm thinking, okay, I'm kidding the audience. Okay, I got my wallet, got my tickets, got my chicken. Uh -huh. I, I'm ready. Yeah. <laughs> Where does this chicken come from? Uh, you don't know. When you narrow it down, it had to be shut. Yeah. So I take the chicken, being from Detroit. Yeah fact that I'd never been on a farm in my life. Right. It's a bird. Yeah. It has feathers. Yeah. It has wings. Right. It should fly. Sure. <laughs> yeah. So logically. So I take it and I loft it into the audience, figuring it'll fly a little bit. Somebody will catch it, take it home. They'll be, they'll, what a great souvenir. Sure, yeah. Well, it plummets into the audience. Yeah. And the audience tears it to pieces. And that's where it's at. The, the Peace Festival. The Peace Festival. <laughs> and throw the parts back on stage. And now there's bloody chicken parts, all these feathers. And the next day in the paper, Alice Cooper slaughters chicken. Yeah. Drinks yeah, the blood yeah, and everything. Right, right. Frank calls me up and he goes, did you kill a chicken on stage last night? And I went, no. He said, well, don't tell anybody. They love it. He said, it's great press. They love it. You know, now I'm the geek of all time, right? Now, the kicker to the story yeah. is the first five rows are all in wheelchairs. Yeah. Right. They put all the people in wheelchairs on this. They're the ones that killed the chicken and maimed the chicken. And the, the wheelchair <laughs> the people. The wheelchair people. <laughs> the ones that probably have a right to have a chip on their shoulder. Yeah, or know, a chicken they, on their shoulder. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So, and, the, and to me, it, it, all of it didn't... 
I, I, I kept going. I, I didn't really, you know. Yeah. And the ship goes, don't, don't kill, just you eat, killed the chicken. Yeah, yeah. Stick it. Stick to it. Stick to it. <laughs> Own it. Yeah. So after this stuff, like, so you're hanging out with John Lennon too, and that's where you meet John Lennon? Perfect. John loved what we were doing. Yeah. John and Yoko at this point. Oh, so they that was, saw this uh, this art that was going on stage. So he was under the influence oh, of Yoko, and there's real art it, going on, right? It, performance art. The Doors knew us from when we were little kids, you yeah, know, basically. Yeah. And they went, "Yeah, uh-huh. Jim Morrison, yeah, man, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah." So th- we had people that saw what we were doing, and they loved the fact that it was doing something different. And how did you feel, like you know, intentionally as a showman doing it different? But what what was your feelings about the counterculture and the, and the hippie movement, or like because you were you we were never separate. connected to it, right? We we were not hippies, right? You know, I mean, yeah. we were in this Your for Detroit rock Ferraris guys. and blondes yeah. and all the right reasons. We were in the rock and roll business for that. Yeah, you know, we were not. We could care less about Vietnam. Right. You know, I mean, yeah. it, it was not political. Yeah. It was just we were fun. Right. And that Good, was dark, what was weird missing. Fun. Yeah, we were. That's what was missing in rock and roll right then was fun. But also, like I imagine that somehow or another, because of the news that was happening in the world, that the extreme take that you guys were having resonated because there was a, a certain pervasive darkness going on. Yeah, we right? were. We were. You know, called uh, satanic. Mm-hmm. All this. There was nothing satanic, especially for me. I'm coming from a Christian background, so there's nothing satanic going on up there. You, it wasn't. You know, it wasn't. There, there was, was no upside down crosses. But or there's anything. no backstory to it necessarily. No, it's. It was. That's when I realized it was basically vaudeville. Right. It yeah. was. It was basically whatever you could get away with, and make if you, they laughed, great. Right. If they were shocked, even better. So, you know? right. So, like, as it evolved into, you know, guillotines, mannequins, electric chairs, the it snake. Pure vaudeville. Right. You were like, what What else can we do? And it, but, it, but it was, the great thing was you had to do it with this really straight face, like you really meant it. Mm-hmm. And st- to this day, I still do it that way. Right. And when you do that, you, people, I think, know they're buying into a character. Well, I mean, it seems that, you know, that a lot of your stuff throughout the years spoke specifically to a kind of, uh, I, uh, you know, adolescent isolation and anger. Yeah. And, you, you know, we which... were outsiders. Gaga's doing the same thing right now. Sure. Gaga, well, I, I yeah. just saw Gaga the other night in Vegas. Yeah, yeah. And it was all about be yourself, be the outsider. Right. Be accepted. Be, you know, don't let them bully you. You know, you're, right. you're, you're, you're perfect the way you are. And I went. Yeah, I get that. We sure. we represented the great disenfranchised. Right, right. All the kids that didn't like Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young were our guys. And that, <laughs> right, and that, and then you sort of set the table for what you know metal became in a yeah. lot of ways. And punk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it, that's right. You're pre-punk. Yeah, right. Very pre-punk. Even actually, without knowing it, I think Iggy Pop was easily. The punk master. No, definitely. He was, there definitely. was nobody like that. And yeah. it only could have come out of Detroit. Right. Because that was the real, they were the real deal. Yeah, they, they're great, man. Those and, Ashton boys. And, and nobody Ooh. said, ever said punk. They just, they just said this. Well, it didn't really show up for another, like, 69, that first Stooges record. So oh. by 72, the three of those records are done and then they kind of disappear. And then well, not they, until 76. Well, what? they always give the Ramones that punk. Yeah, but they're, that, se- but that's 76, way, 77. Way. The Ramones were, were feasting on, on Iggy and the Stooges. But, well, I mean, I, I realized today that, like, you know, I want to be elected and I want to be sedated are pretty close. Very close. <laughs> Joey told me that. He did? Yes. He says, you know, I want to be sedated. He says, yeah, elected. <laughs> Really? Yes. Oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> yeah, because I called him on it. Oh, you, you know, did? when I heard you it, did? I was laughing. I was in New York. I said, "I want to be sedated." And he goes, "Yeah, I know. I, I know." know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so nice that he cop to it. He seemed like a sweet guy. Oh, he was one of the coolest guys. And you know, he says, "Yo, you guys, all we listen to is you and the Stooges and the MC5, and the, that's how we became the Ramones." You know, <laughs> he cop to it. I was listening today, and I'm like, "Wait a minute!" Oh, yeah. And I, today, this morning, I cross checked the dates, yeah. and I want to be elected, and I want to be yeah. sedated. And I'm yeah. like, "Hmm, yeah." yeah. So that's and, a, and no, that was, you know, that was Lennon's favorite song. I want to be elected. Uh, elected. He used to come to the office in New York. He'd come in and he'd listen to the acetate. I want to be elected, and he'd leave. Yeah. He'd come back the next day. Let me hear that again. He'd leave. Shep would play it for him. Leave. Finally, he's leaving the third day, and I'm coming in. And he goes, great record. Oh, you yeah. Know? And I said, oh, thank you, man. He's, and he takes about four steps. And he goes, Paul would have done it better. 
<laughs> and I went, well, yeah. <laughs> Paul. I said, well, of course he would have, you know. And at that point, what, Lennon was on his own, and, you know, so, and Shep, I guess, was the, the Harry Nelson, John Lennon, and that whole scene. Yeah. That and, weird... and in L.A., that was the Hollywood Vampires. With, that's your group? That your was game? our drinking club. Was We lived in L.A. then. Go to the Rainbow every night, and it would be Harry would show up, bring John, if John was in town, Keith Moon, yeah, Mickey Dolenz, really? Bernie Toppin, myself, and whoever else showed see, that, up. See, to me, that's an interesting alignment that, like, like I don't think I put it together till this morning that, yeah, I mean, you did a record with Bernie Toppin. Yeah. And, you, you know, like- Bernie was my best friend. Really? Yeah. And it's just like, you know, I, in my naivete before, you, you know, really like looking at the overarching view of your career, like I would never associate you with Elton John. Yeah. But, you know, but so many of the songs are like, even that, like the couple albums ago where you played with, um, with Bon Jovi's guys. Yeah. 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 That, you know, a, a, most of the great Alice Cooper songs are very accessible songs. Yeah. A lot of that has to do with a guy named Desmond Child. Uh huh. Desmond Child. I listened when that eighties thing happened. I mean, we well, had yeah. already been established. Disco Plague was already kind of in, you know, in motion. Mm -hmm. And they would, you're talking about the ballads. They would only play ballads from rock bands. Right. Kiss, right. Be Beth, Aerosmith, right. Alice Cooper only would play. Dream would, On. And they would only play our ballads. Yeah. So was it like you had, it was by, ne it was necessity. Yes. Yeah. We wanted, still needed to be on the radio. Yeah. The rest of the album was all rock songs. Right, exactly. There. Right. So all of a sudden, there's Bon Jovi. Yeah. And there's Motley Crue. Right. And there's Warrant. And all these M coming along right with MTV. Yeah. Right exactly with MTV. And what are they doing? Great shows. Yeah. And what do they got? Great image. Yeah. Really swagger. Yeah. And, you know, and all of them are making great records. Yeah. And I'm listening to these records. I'm going, wow, good. And you'd already had one life. Yeah. And this is sort of like I'm looking at it and going, okay. Uh, I get what they're doing, and and finally somebody's doing big shows, right? With production, right? And, and rock and roll's fun again, yeah. You know, yeah. And Guns and Roses, I right. mean, you know, there's some real swagger on stage now, yep. you know, yeah. Which was desperately needed, and That's still the 80s, is right now. The '80s, the Roxy, that whole scene, right? So yeah. everybody had glam, yeah. was going on, and yeah, this and, is and these bands, and I kept saying, what is the common denominator with these songs? And yeah. it was Desmond Child. Uh -huh. He was the one producing and writing these songs that every one of them I heard on the radio. About, what is that? Yeah, you give love a bad name. Great record. Yeah, you know, <laughs> right. Uh, and it all came back to him. So I got in touch with him. I said, I want to do the same thing, but I want it darker and sexier, and I want it to be Alice Cooper. And that's when we did Poison, oh, uh, biggest Poison. hit of our career. I mean, right. Schools Out was a huge hit. Right, Poison worldwide right. was even bigger. And that yeah, so that was trash. That was the trash. big that was the big resurgence. That was kind of me raising my ugly head saying, "Oh, by the way, guys, you still have to deal with me." <laughs> right? And, and I think the beautiful thing about that period it seems to me is that all those guys that grew up on your music was like, "You need any help, Alice?" Yeah. They we were all accessible and they were fun. They're good guys. Yeah, man. And, and I really I was very respectful of how good they were. Bon Jovi and Richie Sambora. Yeah. Whew, yeah, Richie could play anything, man. And Ryan Roxy used to play in my buddy's band in uh, Candy. That's right. Yeah, uh, like Roxy is one of those guys that glam is in his blood. He's a good sound man. I mean, there's like yeah. he played with so many great guitar players and the bass player, the uh, winger. He went on to do his own thing. And I don't like that's not my music per se, but they all sort of trained with you. That's it. Yeah, and uh, yeah. and and all of them brought their own thing to it. Yeah. But but going back, like you know, when did you? So you 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 hit the wall in L.A. and then ended up back in Detroit. Well, this was at the very very beginning. We we when we went around, this was pre all that, uh, you know, sixty eight, sixty nine. Yeah. Finally, we got a gig at the Whiskey and yeah. Go, and I look up at the thing and it says Alice Cooper and who's Led Zeppelin? Come on, I'm not kidding you. Yeah. Alice Cooper and Led Zeppelin at the Whiskey. And nobody had ever heard of either one of us. Yeah. So you saw Zeppelin. You we were played with him. And I think, and Jimmy Hen Jimmy Page walks in, and I go, that guy was in the Yardbirds. Yeah. And right, right then the they were royalty to us. Right. And I went, we open for you. Yeah. And they said, okay, tomorrow night we open for you. Really. The very next night we go to the Cheetah Club and we finally we got two gigs in a row. Alice Cooper and some guy named Pink Floyd. I don't know what he. Come wears. on. I'm not kidding you. <laughs> So it's the original Floyd with Sid. With Sid. Mm -hmm. And we got to be very good friends because we connected up really close. 
you know. Yeah. It, but that was all these bands were all just trying to make it. That's what, but those well, those are the rock bands, you yeah, know. Those are the yeah. one, like you know. It's hard to imagine them playing. Clubs. And everybody's star- starving. I mean, literally starving. So then I got Alice Cooper and Pink Floyd in one house. What year is this? And this is about 1968, something like Come that. Come on, you know. So we're all living in a house. I get up one morning. <laughs> yeah. And I walk in the kitchen. Yeah. And there's Sid Barrett, and he's sitting there, and he still got his velvet clothes. I probably slept and everything. Yeah. And there's a box of uh, cornflakes uh-huh. in front of him. And he's watching the cornflakes dance. Oh, really? And he's going, <laughs> oh. And he's looking at me, he goes, You watching? And this? I'm going, Yeah, okay. <laughs> you know, I go to the other room, I go, Sid is watching the cornflakes box the way I would watch Looney Tunes. Yeah. <laughs> and I went, Wow. Yeah. Yeah, he was already. Well, and it wasn't just a drug. No, he was, he, you know, he was schizo. He yeah. had all kinds of things going on. Yeah. That didn't really show up badly till later. Yeah. But one night we played with him. He hit one chord at the beginning of the show, got a little shock, and just stood there the rest of the show. Really? He didn't play anything. Just stood there. Huh. So, I mean, he was... Out there, yeah. But, like, so like so you you have these huge hits, you know, like Killer and, and School's Out and Billion Dollar Babies do great, right? Those are the big three. We're now the king of the hill. Right. I, yeah, I'm 18, kills it. The most dangerous thing about us yeah. was that we had hit records. Mm-hmm. Now here's this band that mm-hmm. is pretty much hated by n- not just the press, right. but by other bands right. because we were the future. <laughs> right, yeah. You know, and yeah. we were going to make them work now. We yeah. were going to make them do a show. Yeah. You know, yeah. And the worst thing that could happen would be us to have a hit record because now you have the Willy Wonka ticket. You're right, right. Nobody can deny you now. And you can sell tickets. And you and can that, sell tickets and, yeah. you, and you're generating money. So all the guys up on top, all the suits in the record companies are going, that's all they're looking at. That's all they care about. That You don't make money until you make other people money. That's it. Right? And here we were generating money. And now we we don't just have one hit. Now we have schools out. That's Gigantic huge. Gigantic hit. Still huge. Yeah. It's still big. And you must be do, getting checks for that, oh, that song now. It's, it's the national anthem. Right. And then after that, he said, well, Lucky, Lucky, and then Billion Dollar Babies comes out, goes to number one. Now we are there. Yeah. And people have to swallow what we're <laughs> dishing out. Yeah. And of course, now we have money to do production. Right. So now these productions are getting more insane than ever. You know? And it's weird because Billion Dollar Babies, when you listen to it, in, 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 and you've sort of lived through many different lives in, in heavy metal and yeah. rock. Is not, it's not, it's a hard rock record. It's a hard, we were never metal. Right. And, and it was just sort of like, I mean, the song, Hello Hooray is like just, it's, it's a beautiful song. Big song. They're completely accessible. Sure. And Bob Ezrin was the one that said, your image is going to be so strong. You're going to do hard rock. Right. But we're going to make it very palatable. Right. You know, yeah. uh, I read an article. So that was the plan. Uh, yeah. Oh yeah. Make hit records. We wanted to make hit records. <laughs> right. I read an article yeah, yeah. that McCartney did and he was it was conversations with McCartney yeah and he says he was had the radio on and he heard no more Mr. Nice Guy yeah and he says it scared me <laughs> really he said I realized <laughs> that rock could be da- dangerous really he, yeah he says it literally scared me that's he funny he said that song was a threat that's funny and I but said yeah. well it was you know School's Out was the most subversive song ever yeah you know yeah. Uh, blow the school up and everything <laughs> It's weird because it's hard for me to imagine, I guess, because, you know, it, we've had so many years of like, just like, you know, no boundaries with music that that, that at that time was a really, little menacing. Oh, yeah. Because, you know, that record was up against Sinatra. It was up against the Supremes, Simon and Garfunkel. Oh, and 73. All the really, 73. All the really commercial records were out. And all of a sudden, here's this record that's a total, you know, anthem that yeah. that's saying, the joy of blowing the school up. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? And yeah. it's a hit, major hit. And that's so, it's interesting because McCartney took it like he listened to it as a songwriter. Yeah. yeah. This is a great song. Right. Said, but it was threatening. Yeah. <laughs> what album was Only Women Bleed on it? That was on Nightmare. I needed a, I needed a ballad. I needed something that was going to offset all the insanity. Well, I'm a kid, so that's 75, so I'm 12. And in that, you know, that song was everywhere. Yeah. And it was, it's a, it's a heavy hearted, beautiful song. Like I listened to it this morning. I'm getting a little choked up. Yeah. It's, oh no, 15 different <laughs> women recorded it and had hits with it. I mean, Tina Turner, Etta James, people like that heavy. did that song. Heavy. You know what I mean? I went, wow. That's yeah. pretty cool. You know, but at the time they were thinking, of course, I was talking about the woman's, you know, monthly. Yeah. No, Women I, Bleed. And I was going, no, 
Yeah. I said, I needed this for the nightmare. Well, they didn't listen to the fucking song then. Right. Yeah. So I, I needed the, and I wanted a ballet. Yeah, that was a concept me. record. The nightmare was... A, oh, yeah, was, pure concept. Yeah. It was little Stephen couldn't wake up out of his nightmare. And right. He could hear his mother calling, but he couldn't wake up. Right. That was the nightmare of not being and that's able where to you, climb out of it. But that's where you start when you're writing a song? Do you you, you, the, you the, pick a story? The concept was that. And welcome to my nightmare, Bob Esther. And I said, Bob, we got here's the idea. Mm -hmm. I said, now we have to write all these songs that connect into this nightmare. And we have to then produce it on stage as a nightmare. And what were the props for that tour? It was a bed that came out at the very beginning. Yeah. We had dancers, but we didn't have rock dancers. Yeah. We had Broadway dancers. Right. I said, I want to, I don't want rock dancers. I, yeah, want, yeah. I want a ballet. I want this, 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 this. So that when people see this, it's going to be something they've never seen before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a Broadway show, except on our terms. Right. And you were thinking Broadway. That's oh, funny. Yeah. yeah. So the bed comes out and Alice is on the bed singing, welcome to my nightmare. I, I hope you like it. And all, all of a sudden... Dancers come off from under the bed because that's where all the monsters live under sure, the bed. Sure, and they're yeah, and they're really good. They're, and people are just sort of like, "What's going what on? What the hell is this?" And is this post guillotine? Post? Oh, yeah. We didn't. I think in that show, yeah, we did the guillotine, but we had a you know fourteen foot cyclops that came out. We had oh, a, that you killed. Yeah, uh, they actually pretty much killed me. I finally pulled his head off oh, and right. stabbed him with it. But so, this, so this Iron was Maiden took sort months. of Iron Maiden knows you. Thanks too. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> We were using Eddie way before they were. <laughs> but there was no bar. See, there was no limits. Yeah. Yeah. We had a budget of whatever we wanted. I, I said, I want David Winters from West Side Story to choreograph it. I want, we got him. Really? We got Disney to build the characters. Uh huh. We got everything worked. Yeah. And Shep and I looked at each other. I said, I put every penny I have into this production. So he said, so did I. Yeah. <laughs> better work yeah <laughs> you know but we had bob Ezrin. yeah and, and that and that was the billion dollar or the welcome, uh, to, my welcome to my nightmare tour nightmare, and it bam it worked it killed it was just we did we couldn't do enough shows it now, sold out like months in advance it's great and and how did like how did you choreograph this stuff did you have to hire somebody specifically so you didn't kill yourself yeah that was that was basically david winners yeah and then we brought in certain people for special effects like uh um we bring in uh amazing randy yeah. The magician. Oh, yeah, the he magician came in on and staff? I said, how do we do this guillotine so it looks exactly right? Yeah. I want the head to, and I want blood to splatter into the audience. Yeah. And if he you're wearing it out. white in the front, I said, you're going to get covered. Right? Yeah. And he, perfect. He figured yeah. it out. I said, how do I get out of this? How do I show up here yeah. after they see me here? You know, and we did all that stuff. Oh, and you used to, yeah, I just remember, wasn't there some uh, sadness or like, you used to hang yourself too? They did the hanging that didn't work one night. <laughs> and you, and you, really, you almost killed yourself. Well, it, you know, it, it's a wire yeah. that connects to the back of your right. thing. That's, and I said, how do you do this? The stuntman came in, showed me how to yeah. do it. Very safe thing. It stops you an inch before. Oh, God. Right? How are you doing Every that, night man? when that floor dropped in, I was going, oh. it I would get, just uh, stop right oh, there. Oh, God. This one night, the wire breaks. Oh. And so I, when, as soon as I feel this, and I can feel that's more tension than I snap my head back. And it goes up over my chin. Oh, God. If I were Jay Leno, I'd be dead. Yeah. With the chin, <laughs> okay. you know. So, yeah. but I luckily, uh, and I went down and knocked myself out and had a burn right here. But it must have broken in, in enough time to where it didn't snap your it neck. It didn't snap my neck because yeah. I, I felt the pressure and let. And but the drop, it, it must have it must have dropped and then boom, and it then broke. It couldn't catch me. It didn't right. catch me under here. It happened very quick. Catch me under there. Holy shit. But, you know, you can't believe how fast your brain works to save your life. Yeah. Boom. Yeah. And, and this wire that was only this big piano wire now is this big. <laughs> Are you still doing it? Well, if we do it. Yeah. You know, we, we always have it. And you're shit-faced on top of it. And on top, but never on stage. No? That was the crazy thing. When I went in for my alcoholism, right, to the... to The, the first time? To the, uh, yeah, to the... Um, uh, it was in uh, up in Cornell University. Uh-huh. And... The guy says... 77? So he says, how much does Alice... I, I blame everything on Alice, of course. <laughs> he says, how much does Alice drink on stage? Yeah. And I went, well, when I'm playing Alice, I never drink. Right. And he says, well, when you're doing a movie or like that, how much do you drink? And I said, well, I n never drink when I... And he says, so the monster's not the problem. Right. The doctor's the problem. <laughs> he says, you know, 20, the, 20, the two hours you're on stage, you're yeah. fine. Yeah. The yeah. other 22 hours... Yeah. That's the problem. You're the monster. And I went, yes, I never thought of it. 
I always thought it was Alice that caused the drinking. It had nothing to do with Alice. Oh, so you were fact, blaming Alice. It was the only time that I wasn't drinking uh-huh. was when I was working. Because you were, you were out of you. <laughs> yeah. When right. I was on stage, I was clear. Yeah. You know. And so. when you first have that, like, be, before we get into the, the recovery, like, how did you have these relationships with, like, you know, you, you talk about Elvis, you talk about Sinatra. I mean, obviously, you know, Nielsen, who, like, who I got into real heavy a couple of years ago. Oh, Harry was great. What a fucking voice, dude. Yeah, yeah, and what a writer. Yeah. Man, the guy. Well, he was, you know, he the Beatles called him the best, you know, yeah. writer in America. You, you can know. hear a lot of, uh, in Lennon solo work, you can hear a and lot. And McCartney, some of the... Oh, really? The honky, I mean, some of these, you know, show tune kind of things. And even the production a little bit. Yeah. But how did you have relationships with Elvis and Frank Sinatra? I know Chef told me you and Groucho were buddies. Groucho and I were... Well, Groucho came to the show out of curiosity somehow. What year are we talking? Um, Probably, well, let's see, when did he... He was 86 years old. Yeah. It was... Mm, it was when we were doing well it was always it was always vaudeville it didn't yeah. matter what era it was right in. but he comes to the show and they said what did you think of alice cooper and he says alice is the last hope for vaudeville <laughs> that's that's how it got started and i said that's the greatest compliment now groucho and i are yeah, buddies yeah. buddies shep d- ends up managing him yeah because from, from what i understand it was possible mismanagement going on right oh and then I, they did that live record right yeah right. yeah yeah and shep could yeah, and Shep never got paid. He said, "I never, I don't want to get paid." He told him right up front. He said, yeah. "I don't want to get paid for anything. I just want to balance your books." Yeah, and I want to help make sure you. you're okay. Yeah, yeah, make sure you're okay. So we got to be really good friends. Yeah, he'd call me up two in the morning. Mm-hmm. Alice can't sleep. Come on over. Okay. Yeah. So I'd come over. He'd be in bed. He'd have his beret on and yeah. a cigar. Yeah. You know, and there'd be a chair next to his bed. Yeah. Of the six pack of Budweiser. Uh huh. And he'd say, we'd sit and watch movies. Oh, really? Movies. Oh, that's sweet. And this guy would ride up on the horse. You yeah, know, yeah. Like this, yeah. you know. And they go, you know. And he'd say, see that guy? I go, yeah. He says, gay. Yeah. <laughs> and he goes, no, he wasn't. I said, that. You know, he never knew if he was. He was telling you all the right. stories. He says, see that nurse there? Yeah. yeah. The Catholic nurse? Yeah. yeah. And, well, yeah. Harpo and Chico both nailed her. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sitting there and I'm going. I could believe this, but I know who, where, I know what the source is right now. Yeah, but he's probably telling the truth, though, right? He ended up being, I I got along with Groucho better than I got along with most rock guys. It was so funny because, like, I think one of the Ashton brothers had a relationship with Larry from the Stooges. He used to go out and visit him, you know, from from their namesake. And I had saw to... I saw him at, at a park bench on Hollywood Boulevard, and we walked by, and I went, Larry. He goes, hey, what are you talking? Hey, you know, yeah, it's yeah. good to talk to you, man. <laughs> And it was so great because we loved those guys. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. we 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 worshipped the Bowery Boys, sure. the yeah. Muggsy, and yeah, yeah. Those guys were our guys. Yeah, you know, that's sweet. So when we got to meet those guys, that to me was, I think I was the only rock star that was a friar. Oh, really? Because Groucho, he brought you in, and 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 all the guys, you know, everybody had to have tuxedos on, and I'd have all black leather, and uh-huh. I was totally accepted. Yeah. I, I still work at the comedy store. You're friends with Mule Deer, right? Yeah. Oh, Gary's one of my best buddies. Yeah. yeah I mean, I, I was there. I was a doorman there back in the 80s doing blow. And then I, you know, I, I cleaned up. I came back. I still work there. It's beautiful. That's great, man. I, I, and Gary's one of, you know, how, yeah. much, how much fun is that guy? Yeah. He was like, So you yeah. can imagine you walk into a room. I've not talked to him. I should talk to Gary Mule Deer. Y- you walk in, you sit down. Yeah. Between Jack Benny and yeah. George Burns. At the Friars. Steve Allen. Yeah. Everybody. And you're Alice Cooper. And you're Alice Cooper. And they treat you just like you're one of the guys. It's show business, buddy. It's the coolest thing in the world. Well, that's the one thing I realize about you is you love show business. I do. I, I love these guys. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah, you know yeah. They, I mean, I never tried to make a joke. Yeah, yeah. The, because they were always... But you see yourself as a showman. Right. The great thing was they all sat there. When one guy would walk in, everybody yeah. would be quiet. Yeah. Jonathan Winters. Oh, yeah. When What's Jonathan gonna Winters happen? walked in, they'd all go, yeah. watch this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Because <laughs> he was, woo. I talked to him before he died. I went to his house. Good actor too. He's great. He was. Uh, he was just a really sweet, uh, beautiful. I bought guy. a couple of his paintings. Oh, you did? Yeah, he did surrealistic paintings. Yeah, yeah. He's yeah. into. Yeah, he was a painter, and yeah. he's. Yeah, it was real, uh, real honor. I drove up and I got the opportunity to talk to him. It was just a couple of years before he passed, and it was wild Amazing to be at guy. his house. And yeah. we went out to lunch. Do you he, remember? Do you remember the time that him and Robin Williams? Yeah, did sort of the. The improv off. And yeah, yeah, yeah. when Robin Williams just put a white flag up. Oh, so yeah, I yeah, give up. yeah, yeah. I give yeah. up. He's, I can't stay with him. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. They're very similar. I talked to both of them before they died, and, they, and it was very interesting the the similarities and yeah. their the darkness in their brain. Yeah, but uh, all right. So, and Frank Sinatra. Sinatra. Yeah. 
I got along with him. I never saw the dark side. Well, no, but how did you meet him? How did you end up having a relationship with Frank Sinatra? It was a baseball game in in Vegas, Mm -hmm. a celebrity baseball game. And our team was Kenny Rogers, the Carpenters, Steve Martin, Uh Albert Brooks, myself, like this. Okay. So when we're playing the police department or whatever in the afternoon... And there's this kid trying to get in the game. He's about 12. Yeah. He wants to get in like this. And I finally go over and I said, let him in. I put, I put him on the bench. Yeah. And he sits there. I gave him my hat. And, oh, this is great. You yeah, know? yeah. I'm walking to the casino that night. And this guy says, hey. Yeah. So what? He says, the boss wants to see you. The boss. I went, who's the boss? <laughs> you know? <laughs> and I go over there in Sinatra. Yeah. And he's sitting there. He says, Coop. Yeah. First one to ever call me Coop. Uh-huh. And he says, Coop. He <laughs> said, I owe you one. I went, Mr. Sinatra. He's Frank. Yeah. Went, okay, Frank. But uh, I, I have no idea. He said that kid was uh, Jilly's brother, uh, son. Yeah. Jilly's son. Jilly was his best friend. Uh huh. Oh yeah. He did a solid for him, man. He said, I mean, you did a solid for me. Uh huh. Oh really? And I went, wow. Yeah. That's, that's you know. I said, well, you know, I, just a kid wants to see a baseball game. He said, yeah, yeah, but he said, I owe you one. Uh huh. <laughs> so yeah, we we met a couple of times, and you know. But anyways, two years later, you never took him up on the favor. Bernie Top. Well, Bernie Top and I. Yeah. Both get invitations to the Hollywood Bowl. Uh huh. For Sinatra? Yeah, for Sinatra. I said, oh, how cool. If Sinatra remembered that and got us tickets. How oh, was great. it seeing him? Yeah, it was great. So we sat there, you know, we got, this is great. Hey, yeah, the boss wants to see both of yous. <laughs> yous. <laughs> so we go out. There's Frank. He's got a tie undone. He's uh, got a martini and a cigarette. Yeah. You know, he said, I'm going to do one of your songs tonight. Get out of he here. He did You and Me. Really? Yeah. And I went, what? And he says, yeah, good song. You know, you keep writing them, kid. I'll keep singing them. <laughs> and he said, Bernie. Yeah, he said, I'm doing one of Elton's songs. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he did your song. Yeah, he did. And that's how he paid me back. That's fucking... And I just went, I said, you can't... I it's... said, that's more than I could ever yeah. think of. That's beautiful. And he says, I, I just do songs that are good songs. He said, just happen to be yours. Yeah, you know? that's and, amazing. And I got to know him a bit better afterwards, you know, in the Friars Club and yeah. everything. And I always got along with him. Yeah. You know? Peter yeah. Sellers was another guy that you never saw the dark side of him. Yeah. He was always just, he was Clouseau sometimes, and he was this guy. and Yeah, he know, was in it. But I never saw the dark side of him. Sure. Well, they didn't see the dark side of you. Yeah, no. They really never <laughs> did. I mean, it means, like, in retrospect, it's something you completely understand. No, they got it. They yeah. got the fact that I played the character. Right. They were all actors. They got it. Right. But you didn't quite get it sometimes. Yeah. I, sometimes I was a little bit, yeah. <laughs> well, who, do I, who am I today? You know? <laughs> but it's amazing that you, you know, you're sort of, like, when I saw you, Conan, just like, what was it, less than a year yeah. ago, and, yeah. I, and I was watching you, you know, with the cane, and, and I'm like, this guy's a, he's a showman. This I'm Fred Astaire, is, man. Yeah, man. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so let's let's go let's go uh, into the middle and like you know because obviously we could talk all day, but like you, you know when you do hit the wall with alcohol, yeah. you know, because you're just drinking beer, did you not really know that you were beer and whiskey at ten o'clock, right? Okay. Whiskey at nine o'clock, okay. whiskey at eight yeah, o'clock. Yeah, yeah. Pretty soon it's whiskey at eight in the morning. Okay, yeah. And uh, shaking I, and everything. I, no, no. I was I was Dean Martin. Did you come from it? You come from no, alcohol? No, no, no. I I I I had no idea that alcohol was running me. I just figured, hey, it's part of the part this, of the yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. I was never drunk. Yeah. I was always on this golden buzz. Yeah. Which is dangerous. Sure. Because you don't realize what's going on in your body. Right, and you're not realizing it takes a lot to feed that buzz. It keeps getting more and more. Pretty soon, the pancreas is. Yeah, you know, I'm pretty, I get up in the morning, and throw a blood, right, and that was the uh, the alarm for the you first know, time. Yeah, my you... wife says, "Let's go." Yeah, and Shep says, "Let's go." And, and they and checked I did. you in. I did. They checked me in. Hard, hardest thing in the world for them. They both cried their eyes out going back to New York. But boy, did I need to be in there. And you didn't withdraw. No, I didn't. It was funny. The first three days, I yeah. felt like my nerves endings were on the outside of my body. Right. If somebody did. Yeah. Uh, right, right, yeah. But I never went through the kind of DTs, yeah. this, yeah. you know. Right. But four days in, yeah. I started feeling really good. Really? And I started feeling really, really good. And I went, wow. Yeah. This is kind of really strong. Right. So I was in for a month, over a month, maybe uh-huh. six weeks. And, uh-huh. and I came out dead straight. Straight for a year, I had one sip of white wine, and I hate white wine. And One just sip, and it. that night I had three bottles hidden in the house. Re- that quick? That quick. I had no idea I was that much of a Were you alcoholic. doing the thing? You I, know, the secret meetings? No, no. Never never, never went, went to AA. I yeah. was totally fine. Yeah. Ended up, 
almost ruining my marriage, ruining my career. The second time. Yeah. Right right. And, and, but you did a record in between, though, right? Yeah, you did, oh, I did three records. That, but that when were, did, like, From the Inside come out? Was that right after that you was, got oh, out? Oh, yeah. That was, that was about the hospital. Yeah. When I was finally, you know, when I, the first time when I came out, I said, Bernie. Bernie is my best friend. We're both lyricists. Yeah. And I go, I got to tell you about these characters in there. Oh, yeah. And when I start telling them about Jackknife Johnny and Millie and Billy yeah. and Nurse Rosetta yeah. and all these people that we just started writing. I mean, it, you just, and it was just flowing yeah, yeah, out yeah. of us, you know. Yeah. Uh, Might have been the best musical record we ever did. Yeah. You like that record? Yeah. Different was, producer, too, right? Yeah. 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 Um, but, you know. Then you realize. I, I, when I fell, I was so surprised when I fell back. Yeah. I was, I couldn't believe I I was that much. It was that much of a trigger for me. And and, and clearly it, it was go, it was worse than before. Yeah, because now you you don't just gradually get drunk again. You're right back where you were. Right. And so, I somehow, got into Phoenix. I, I I finally had enough. My parents, my wife's parents. Uh-huh. My wife finally said, you know, the whole intervention, you're going. And I said, okay, well, I, I, I no, now. No shit. So and you, I, I went to the a Camelback uh, uh, Hospital. Yeah. When I came out, this is one of the great, you know, sky opens up yeah. things. Uh, and one of the, one of the reasons I became Christian again. Yeah. Is I came out and I went right to a bar, and I had a Coca Cola uh-huh. and waited for that craving, waited for it because I'm going to be around alcohol all my life. So I'm going to. You want to deal deal sat with it? There, sat there. Nothing. Huh. Okay. Tomorrow's going to be hell. Yeah. Wake up in the morning. Nothing. No obsession. Thirty five years later, never once a craving. And the doctor says, That's insane. That's you were the classic alcoholic. How many meetings do you I said, never been to a meeting. Mm. And they said, Well, your willpower I said, I have no willpower. I have zero <laughs> willpower. You know. I said, God took it away from me. I said, I truly believe it was a miracle as much as parting the Red Sea was God said it's enough. And, and I never it. had a never never had another never fell back yeah. never had another drink it never occurred to me to have a drink you know hosting the Grammys I'm going oh my gosh never occurred to me to have a drink and the obsession out. was lifted as they said yeah it was gone yeah. it was totally gone and the, even the doctor said we have to write that down as a miracle because you should be hiding things all over the house you should be watched at all times right <laughs> right considering your past and everything like that. And I said, it's gone. Mm. I said, it's it's as if it never existed. You could put a drink in front of me and I, what? Mm. And I wouldn't even think of drinking that. And is that when you start- Is that weird? No, yeah. I mean, it is I mean, weird. It's, it's but... biblical, you know? So, and, and, and that's I when- Realizing that that was from a higher source. Right. It was not from a doctor. I wasn't a cured alcoholic. I was a healed alcoholic. Yeah. And that told me something. I said, wow, there's something more important than rock and roll to me. <laughs> really? So that was it. That was the yeah. white light moment. That but, was, but it didn't mean I had to quit rock and roll. Right. But it was just a moment that you realized that some power greater than you had a better plan for me. Yeah. Yeah. And and you were wired with Jesus, so why not let it be Jesus? Absolutely. And it, and it got to the point where when I did become Christian, I really got into it and realized that there was no such thing as Jesus saying, "Oh, by the way, you can't be a rock star." He said, "Be a rock star." Yeah. Just be a good person. But represent me. Yeah. And I Wait, went, do you, do you okay. do any do you, do you, do you find do you when you look at your records are there Jesus records? No. But there are references. There's right. a lot of references in there to anti-satanic things. Yeah. There's a lot of little references in there to to if you think hell is going to be getting high with Jim Morrison, yeah. You're right where he wants you. Uh-huh. Right. <laughs> and sure. There was a great line in Usual Suspects. Yeah. The devil's greatest trick was getting you to believe he doesn't exist. Yeah, <laughs> I said that's when I heard that I went, oh, that's a song. That's a great song right there. Yeah. <laughs> but again, it never, it never dissuaded the fact that Alice Cooper was this character that I played, and he was a fun character. Sure. He, well, and, uh, yeah. There was never a time that it just my lifestyle changed. And also, like that character, uh, you know, dis- however it's interpreta- it interpreted, does let a st- little steam, a little pressure out of the dark side. Oh, absolutely. Like, yeah. you know, the sort of like the, the kind of like uh, the weird evil clown. I had no problem injecting a little Clouseau yeah. into this character. I mean, every once in a while, I want Alice to slip on a banana peel yeah. when he's really trying to be arrogant up sure. there. <laughs> I love that. Right. You know, and let the audience in on it. 
Yeah, you know? well, yeah, right. So there's like a tongue in cheek kind yeah. of fun. Well, it'd be shock. You can't shock an audience anymore. Right. Audiences are shock proof. I'm sure. CNN's more shocking than Marilyn Manson, myself, day, and yeah. Rob Zombie put sure. together. In the 70s, it was easy to shock an audience. Now, I get my head cut off every night. You won't turn on CNN. They're really getting their head cut sure. off. Sure. So yeah. how shocking could what, what we do be? And what, what, did you change your life in terms of uh, you know uh, doing charitable things? Oh, yeah. And, it, like... it just came natural. You know, mm-hmm. it, w- when that was now part of my life, um, and now I was following him, I went, it just came natural. You know, here's a bunch of kids in trouble. Wow, we, what can we do to help them out? Sure. You know, I'm in a, such a, a perfect situation here. Here's, I watched a drug deal go down, and it was two 16 year old kids. And one kid's, you know, look at this, yeah. getting the money. And I said, How does that kid not know he might be a great guitar player? Right. He's never been, he's never had a guitar in his hand. The other kid might be the best drummer in town. And I got the idea opening a place where any teenager could come in and learn guitar, bass, drums for free. Mm-hmm. All for free. All we had to do was raise the money, and and so that's for the last twenty years I do that. Yeah, you know, and we get a hundred kids a day in there. Oh yeah, and some of them are cutters. Oh, yeah. Some of them are gang related. And but here's a here's a sixteen year old kid now that's playing guitar instead of selling meth. It works, huh? So his whole life changes. Mm. You know, that's sweet. And and it, but it really is a cool thing to do. It's and it's fun yeah. watching these kids develop into good players. Sure. You know, and Wayne Kramer does a thing too. Another ex junkie in uh, Detroit guy, yeah, MC5. You know he does the guitars for jails. Uh, you find you find that the guys that have gone through it mm-hmm. and have been on that side and 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 survived it mm-hmm. always try to find a way to help kids out. Yeah, and you help other rock guys too, right? Well, if they, you know, I have people always come to me and they say, "You got to call my brother, yeah, because he's an alcoholic." And this, and I go, "I can't do that." Yeah, if he calls me, right. He's halfway home. That right. means he's admitting I got a problem. Right. I've had some pretty big stars call up at three in the morning and say, "Hey, where do I go?" Yeah. You know, and I go, "Okay, you're halfway home." Yeah. yeah. If I had to call you, it's just another finger wagging in your face. Right. Of and course. You can bite it yeah, off. Go yeah. Ahead. Yeah. But attraction rather but than promotion. But if you call me, yeah. you're, you're you're saying, "I'm at the bottom of the rung. Uh-huh. I need help." And okay, now I can direct you somewhere. Sure, you know, and it's it's public knowledge that you helped Mustaine out, Dave Mustaine, right? Dave Mustaine. I just yeah. saw Dave, and uh, we played in Budapest together. And he's a uh, hell he of looks a player. Great man. Yeah, he looks great, but he had a real problem. Yeah, you know. Yeah, and I just finally just back of the neck, gruff of the neck. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> come here. Yeah, <laughs> but you know, <laughs> that's some. The guys that that had the worst problems are the guys that usually end up being the most charitable. Because they they're thankful that mm-hmm. they're not there anymore, mm-hmm. and now they go well. How can I help some other kid not to get to that place? Right. So your last fucked up record was the Dada record. Dada was there was the 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 blank the blackout period records, yeah. which my fans always say are the, my, my best records. Really? Yeah, they love those records. Which one? Like a zipper, zipper catches, catches skin, skin uh, special forces. Yeah. Uh, Dada. Dada. Dada was a little more control. Flush the fashion. Yeah, yeah. You know, well, that's got a hit on it. A lot of people did. Had right? hits on it. Yeah. yeah, but I cannot remember writing. You really any can't. Of that stuff. No, hmm. I don't remember recording it. Dada's trippy, dude. It was, but that was Bob Ezrin, though. Yeah. Bob was. I was fairly okay. At, he knew at Dada. you. Yeah, yeah, and we pretty much knew what we were doing on that record. But yeah. Zipper Catches Skin. Yeah. Yeah, God. And now I listen to it and I go, wow, that song is great. (laughs) (laughs) Good. So some part of you was still working. Some part of me was working. Alice was still working. Yeah. I mean, I listen to the lyrics and I go, there was a song called Zorro's Ascent. Yeah, yeah. It says, I I donned the cape, now I'm Don Diego. You know, and I went, Don, Don. Oh, that's really good. (laughs) (laughs) So you can appreciate what you did in another time zone. My my subconscious was writing pretty good lyrics. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, but, but then like, I guess, like, so you took three years off and then you can't, and then trash turned everything around again yeah. and a whole new generation of, of metal guys, hard rock guys, and a lot of guys that you influenced came to your sort of side and, you know, and you made this great record. Yeah. And, and I think I was, at this point I was trying to prove the fact that I was still in the game yeah. and I was still something to be dealt yeah, with. And you could still sing and still write songs. I and mean, that, I mean, now that's what I was, you did. And now I was working with people that were really good and I was on a roll up. I was rolling you're, up. You're working with a new kind of guitar player. Yeah. 
Like the the actual style of guitar playing changed yeah, in yeah. those three years almost these that you players, were gone. These guitar players were good p- guitar players, man. Yeah, I mean yeah. they weren't just sh- you know schlock players; they were yeah. good. Yeah, and and I was surrounding myself with all the best people. Mm-hmm. I was always around the very. I, I, when I picked a guitar player, it was because he was the best guy at that. Sure, Kane Roberts. Yeah, and Kip Winger. Kip Winger was the best best bass player around. Yeah, you know, yeah. You, you got and they man. all wanted to play with you. Yeah, that was it. And you kept working, you keep, well, that's the thing, you keep working, and then, like, I listened to Welcome to My Nightmare, the second one, and that's another one of these, like, it's, it's just... the funniest record I ever made. It's a good record, man. But and, it's but, comedy, it's all comedy. Yeah, I, like, there's country, you got Vince Gill on Vince there, Gill laying on it. it out, that solo he lays out on that song, it's like, holy shit. When I brought that into my band, yeah, they listened to it, and they all pointed to each other, you, you play it. No, they, they couldn't. Right. He's an amazing guitar yeah. player. I just handed him a Telecaster, and I say, here, yeah. pre- pretend like you're in a rock band. <laughs> No problem. That guy just <laughs> unbelievable. And he had like Patterson Hood on there too, yeah, right? From the yeah. Drive By Trucker. Everyone's on that record. Yeah. But I always look at it as like they're 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 honored to work with you. It's nice to be in that position. Yeah. And the same with this one. You've got uh you've got some good guest stars on panel. Larry to, Mullins Jr. Paranormal was one of those things where Bob said I, I, The drummer I, for you too. Yeah. I yeah. started out saying Let's not do a concept album. Right. Let's just not do one. Let's do 13 great records. Yeah. Great rock songs. Yeah. That you can't deny. Yeah. Okay. We wrote the whole thing, and Bob says, how about this? You yeah. Change the whole bottom of the sound. I said, what do you mean? Larry Mullins Jr. on drums. And I went, wow. Would he do it? He goes, big fan. He says, you know, you two were all big fans of yours, you know. And I went... If he'd do it, that would be amazing. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. And then, you know, we did that one song, I've Fallen in Love and I Can't Get Up. Yeah. And it was a Texas Roadhouse boogie song. And I went, we were looked at each other and went, Billy Gibbons. Yeah. <laughs> there was no doubt. Yeah, and yeah. I sent it to him, you know, and, and he goes, I, I, I got the flu right now, but this song makes me feel better. Yeah. <laughs> you can feel it. You can hear his riff. He I'm did, listening. Oh, yeah. it was, yeah. not, there was no two ways about who had yeah, to play yeah. on that yeah, song. Yeah, yeah, You know. And he sent it back, did two takes, and it killed it. Just yeah. killed it. You know? And you've worked with guys who work with Lou Reed. You work with some Swedish guys. Wa- like Wagner the- and Hunter yeah. uh, were, were probably two best guitar players yeah. on the planet right yeah. then. And yeah. I was, and I had both of them in my band. Yeah, it's, it's just, <laughs> they just love playing with you. Yeah. All right, wait, what's a, it's a great record, I'm, and I'm happy you're still working. You seem fucking healthy as uh, hell. I can't be. I, I'm, I'll be 70 next year, and I'm the only one not breathing hard on stage. Wow. I mean, it's just, and the show is physically as hard as nightmare do you do anything to stay in shape no all right now one thing before you go can you tell me what's so great about golf in a few sentences okay golf <laughs> is an addiction i get it and i'm feeding an addiction and okay I, and i understand it <laughs> but it's also a meditation somehow the guys who love it they there's a relationship that's almost zen with the thing it right? is lou reed uh-huh okay I lived with Lou Reed in at the Chelsea Hotel in the worst of times. You did? Yes. At those times in New York where you walk by the... When you the see, Andy Warhol times? And you see, yeah. And yeah. you see those guys with just their key in the door because they couldn't get it open, so you open the door and push them in. Yeah, close those to, times. And Lou Reed, the last time I saw Lou Reed, he says, Hey, Alice, you know, yeah, hey, man, how you doing? Good, good. He says, I'm pushing the ball to the right. He said, what? And I'm... You know, I did like a triple take, and I went, you play golf? And he goes, oh, yeah. I play no golf kidding. every time. I said, I love it, man. I'm addicted to it. Really? Dylan plays golf. Really? Neil uh, Neil Young plays golf. Uh-huh. Uh, Stephen Stills, Iggy Pop, uh, Roger Waters, mm-hmm. big golfer. So what is they all got in common? <laughs> yeah, okay. I get it. Right. <laughs> they were all guys that survived the drugs and, the booze. Drugs and drinking yeah. thing, and, and all of them got addicted to golf. Mm. I read a thing one time that didn't surprise me. Fred Astaire was talking about W.C. Fields one right. time yeah. in the prime of their career. Yeah. He said, what is this golf thing? Yeah. And W.C. Fields, come on out. Fred Astaire hit one ball and was addicted. <laughs> and he says, it almost ruined my career. First time, it's always free. He hit it down the middle. <laughs> yeah. And it felt so good to watch that ball just disappear down the middle. That little click. And he says he started missing rehearsals. Oh, he couldn't get off with you know, and he and pretty soon he said I had to stop playing because I was literally my career was suffering from it. Wow, <laughs> it gets so addictive. If you hit six good song, yeah. shots, it's like taking six 
good hits. No, okay. and you'll, I, okay. you'll chase it all, all day. Right. All right, I'm sold. <laughs> I'm going to try it. I'm going to try it. And I also wanted to, to say uh, uh, sorry for your loss with uh, Glenn yeah, Campbell. Yeah, Glenn, Glenn was, uh, you know, uh, he could hang with the Rat Pack yeah. or the Sex Pistols. But you guys were tight. No, oh, we were tight. Yeah, we had a lot in common. We and... were both, you know, we were both uh, alcoholics that, yeah. that weren't alcoholics anymore. We were both Christians. Yeah. We were, he, his guitar playing was. It's great. He was another Vince Gill guy. Yeah, that, great. Beyond anybody. And Jerry Reed, too, is another one of those guys. Another guy. Right. But yeah, no, Glenn was, uh, I watched that documentary. It's just hard. Funny as hell. Yeah, yeah. Funny as hell. And our families grew up together. Uh, our kids grew up together. It was, it was definitely time, though, huh? Yeah. It was merciful. Yeah. He got to a point where he couldn't remember anything, you know, and yeah. it was just, it, that, that disease is so vicious. Alzheimer's terrible. Because you just go away and you can't, pretty soon you just disappear. Yeah, yeah. You know. It's terrible. Well, God damn it. was, uh, I mean, yeah, not to use that. It was great talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's all right. It's Father Marin. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're the other Father Marin. <laughs> good, good. <laughs> uh, it, was real, it was real fun, and uh, I'm glad you're doing well. we got to come to the show tonight. Where is it? We're at the Greek Theater. Really? Yeah. It's us and Deep Purple and uh, uh, Edgar Winter. Edgar Winter. Edgar Winter. I'm, I'm sp- what time does that start? Uh, I think we're on at 8. All right, I, maybe I, I'm supposed to do comedy. Maybe I'll do it. Oh, if you have a show, no, yeah, but, I understand. Uh, it's it's great, man. And I, you know, I got family in Phoenix, so you know, I'm out there a lot. My ex my ex wife was from there, but my brother lives there. Oh, great! And uh, so I, I used to should... hike up Camelback. I used to when I was. I there. live uh, right off of Camelback, the nose of Camelback Mountain. Maybe I'll, maybe you get well. I'd just annoy you if I went on the golf no, course. No, with no, you. no, no. Well, I'll get you. I'll All get right. you. I'll All get right. you addicted. Don't worry. All right, buddy. <laughs> Thanks, man. <laughs> What? What? Lou Reed was a golfer? What? What a great conversation. I uh, I really enjoyed it. And I hope you did as well. I'll talk to you when I get home. Okay? I hope you're hanging in. And uh, I, I don't have a guitar. That's just quick improv. Mouth trumpet. Boomer lives! <laughs>